Do you, have you seen this? Have you been out here? But not like an ordinary sandbar. This was a sandbar that was created by a flood that was probably estimated at about three to four hundred million cubic feet per second. Per second? Per second. But you got to bear in mind, Charles, since 12,000 years ago when this thing was built, nothing has disturbed it. It's remained immovable. I see so many people out there have their private problems. We had several friends that flown over. Let me help you. Okay, geographers, what are we looking at here? What states? Where's Washington? Left. Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, um, Great Salt Lake. Now here you can see some of the salt deposits that form the northern part of the Bonneville Salt Flats, right here. Do you see the face? Now, there was a gigantic lake that formed here at the end of the last ice age. There was lakes, huge lakes all over the place. Here goes the Snake River, up here, flows into the Columbia right here, and out to wash out to the Pacific. You can see Hell's Canyon. Yeah, Snake goes through Hell's Canyon, which mm -hmm. is right here. That's where Hell's Canyon is, which is actually the deepest canyon in the U.S., deeper, a thousand feet deeper than Grand Canyon. Yeah. You didn't know that? Mm -hmm. well, now you know. You see in the corner there is Yellowstone, which is pretty close to where the snake originates. So there's Yellowstone Lake right there. Yeah. So this is Yellowstone, right here. The Snake River starts. The headwaters of the Snake come here. Now, at the same time, the Big Missoula flood, which is what we've been looking at the features of, was going on up in here. The Bonneville flood was caused by a giant lake forming down here in Utah, and Nevada that breached the northern pass and gushed out into the Snake River Canyon and flowed up this way and out. And there, you can see that Bitterroot uh, uh, Valley. Here's the Bitterroot Valley yeah, right that's here. That's really prominent. Yes. <coughs> and that was, a, that was a back flood arm of mm -hmm. Lake Missoula. And Bill, I'll tell you about what we did in our trip in August because we were looking for evidence yeah. that uh, it was created by a giant back flood, mm -hmm. and we found it. Okay, so this is that same region out there. Here's the Columbia Gorge comes down through this way. So all of these floodwaters, you see this basin here, all of these floodwaters came from the north and filled this basin here like a temporary inland sea, and its only outlet was right there through that gap. Mm -hmm. So the water just poured through there like a gigantic Venturi flume. And over what period of time was this? Uh, uh, well, it was pretty much the period of deglaciation, although probably the peak floods episodes only lasted a few weeks. And it was probably multiple flood episodes. And here you have your, see your volcanoes? Here's Mount St. Helens, Ooh. Mount Rainier, and Mount Adams. The, the, the Big Bang, the point that everybody has to speculate from, is what was the event that caused the rapid deglaciation? Is that what we're... Yes. Okay, so that thing that provided so much energy that everything just immediately... You got it. I mean, you, you've honed in right on the, the crux of the whole mystery that has not been identified. And, and the problem is, is they're, they're not looking for it because they think they've got an explanation for the flood. And what do you speculate that it was? You just, you just don't know yet. Oh, oh, oh well, yes. Yes. Oh, we get, yes. there's the rub, <laughs> as they say. I've seen three of these over the last, what, three weeks and just don't answer I, the question. I don't answer the question, no. Because what I'm trying to do is see who figures it out from the evidence that I'm I'm laying out a big feast on the table, and I'm waiting to see who comes and partakes of the feast, and at the end of the feast has figured it out. Is that not, is that not fair? Yeah, I've seen the same episode three times. You have to come and figure it out. See, I get, I get a lot of flack because, it, because there's lots of folks that want me to just spell it all out. We don't want to think. We just want you to tell us. 
I'm, I'm coming into this in the second act or, or later. No, so you're terrible. coming into it at four. Four of <laughs> May five. <laughs> Don't worry. I miss the appetizer. Don't worry. Don't worry. Well, see, what Marty has just said, I mean, there, there's the central question that I've been asking for the last couple of years, is trying to focus in on what or who is the culprit. We had a global catastrophe 12,000 to 13,000 years ago. Of that, there's no question. The question that arises is, what could have triggered it? What would have caused it? And the only way we're going to know, and see, the problem is, is mainstream science is only marginally looking at this. And they're also looking at it from such a fragmented viewpoint that they're never going to get it. Because, you know, you can't take a group of scientists who are focusing solely on erosion in the Nile River or somebody else who's looking at deposits on the ocean floor or somebody else that's looking at, at the, the deposition of the pampas mud in Argentina and somebody else who's looking at this and nobody is going, wait a second, what if all that stuff is connected? What if it's all regional expressions of one event? Nobody? And nobody. That I can, I mean, I have been perusing the literature, I mean, in the mainstream. Now, most of those that are, are looking at it from the fringe or from the margins, like myself. This, this has changed, within the last couple of years, it's begun to change. Mm -hmm. We have the Holocene Working Group that formed within the last couple of years that is investigating that Burkle Crater event in the Indian Ocean and looking for evidence of catastrophes during the Holocene, which is the last 10,000 years. No, I thought you said the Burkle Crater was 6,000 years ago. Right? Yes, yeah, so within the last 10,000 years. So this, this predates that. This predates that because what this was, this was the series of events that ended the Pleistocene, the two million year period that preceded right. our current warm, stable, interglacial episode that's lasted now for eight to 10,000 years. Here, you can see the scarring from this, these floods. You see all of the branching channels. All of this is scars. Which these guys have all seen this before. This is a coulee. See, this is what's called Grand Coulee. So the, the central question then, like Marty just raised, is what was the mechanism? And that's the thing that I've been trying to get to the bottom of for really, literally, a quarter of a century. Now, you, you said something the first time I saw you this go around this year, um, three weeks ago, about the answer lying somewhere up in the Canadian Rockies, and that's what you're going to go see this yes. year. So, can you show us, <laughs> can you show us the map? <laughs> well, the other thing is that well, the way scientists are trained is they, they are more or less trained to look and isolate stuff, and they'll say, oh, well, here's a volcanic event. Here's a, a, a conflagration that a bunch of stuff burned. Here's flooding. Here's they don't put it together, and they would just have, they'd go into fits to think that it all happened together because they're trained to see them as separate parts. That's and the like people this. that are doing it, they might put two of the five together, maybe, and but not all five. Uh, that's that's exactly it. It's a reductionist nature of science. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm going to break it down to the, into the smallest. Okay. Well, here's new stuff that I've not shown you yet. Ooh. And it's premature, but because Marty brought it up. <laughs> Ready, Marty. Now, here we have satellite view of the Canadian Rockies. And this should be familiar. Here's Washington down here. And here's the channel scab lines that we were just looking at. Now, again, all of this is the Canadian Rockies up here. And this is where we're going, into the heart. And here's a closer up view. Now, when you look at this, what you'll see is, let me see, hopefully I've done a graphic here. Um, no, I haven't. See, this is, the reason I haven't shown you this yet is because it's not finished. And I have to insert some graphics. But you can get the idea if I jump back to here. <clears throat> now, this graphic is instructive. Here you see the distribution of the ice. Now the area we've been looking at is within this box. Now this is taken from a, uh, a map publication that's put out by, I don't know if it's the U.S. Geological Survey, but it represents the conventional academic view. 
Now you'll notice, I find it's highly significant. What they've done is they've taken this region of the Missoula flood and see how they put it in a box? Now, <laughs> studies of the Missoula flood, you're not allowed to go outside that box. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously. Yeah. You, you're not supposed to. Yeah, Marty. Okay, am I to assume then that there was no glacier over Siberia, Russia? That's a correct assumption, yes. And it, therein is another one of the mysteries of the Ice Age. That's yeah. right. In fact, if you look at the center of the mass of the ice sheet, it's right in here. The, so you've got the Laurentide and the Cordilleran. You had two great ice masses that grew together. The center of the Laurentide is where Hudson Bay is. And this is where it was like this dome here was where it was three miles thick. Mm -hmm. Now, if you draw a circle around this here, it's actually bigger than this current South Polar ice cap. But what's interesting to me is, is that circle that just encompasses this whole ice sheet is just about the same size as the present day Arctic circle. Mm -hmm. it, it, like, uh, Lake Bonneville shows up on that. Right, there you see Lake Bonneville mm -hmm. right there, of which great modern Great Salt Lake is but a remnant. Mm -hmm. So you can see how the ice in that area terminates right there just south of the 49th parallel. Okay, here we see Canada, United States, and here you can see the configuration of the ice relative to the so-called lake. Missoula right there. Now the Camus Prairie width that we were looking at would have been right up in here, mm -hmm. right up in there. The Flathead Lake was where that lobe of ice is. Position of Camas Prairie doesn't make sense at all if you, if it's a if that was the source of the water. It makes all the sense that the water was coming from the north. It doesn't make a bit of sense to see Marty. The, 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 the current theory is is that you had this lake here, and it was held in by an ice dam, <laughs> and then the ice dam gave way, and the lake drained out and flowed across Washington, down here converging at Wooloola Gap and then out here to the Pacific Ocean. And flooding into the Willamette. Back flooding into the Willamette Valley, right. I say no. What I'm saying is what we're seeing is that this is the melting of the whole ice mass that covered the Canadian Rockies to the north of here. And that's a far more plausible, logical explanation than assuming that you could have a dam of ice holding back a 2,000 foot deep lake. Here we have another perspective on it. So this would have been the ice dam right here. And this would have been the lake over here. And then when it flowed out, it created all of these, all this erosion that you see here. So, okay, so let's go back to Canada. See, the, the problem now becomes, how do you, how do you come up with an energy source great enough to create massive melting? <laughs> well, <laughs> notice here all of these mountain valleys. Here's the Channel Scabland down here, and you'll notice Lake Okanagan coming down in this nice valley. Anybody been up there? Lake Okanagan? Ogopogo? <laughs> Did you know there's a monster in here, like the Loch Ness monster? Uh, really? That's right, we were focusing on rocks instead of monsters. But you see what we really are been on the trail here is for the, is the cosmic monster. Okay, now every one of these valleys, this comes down, here's a valley. See how all these valleys are north-south trending? Look at this one, look at this one, look at this one. Uh, Where do they intersect? Here's Flathead. Well, they don't. They're, they're parallel lineations that run up through the Canadian Rockies and there are these north-south valleys that were completely filled with ice. There's now, if we were going to introduce a massive energy source, what would be one potential that we could do that? A meteorite. That to me would be uh, culprit, most likely culprit number one, uh, right there. Okay. okay, now, the problem here is that if you have a meteorite, 
and the meteorite or asteroid or comet is hitting the ice, it's, and the ice is thousands of feet thick, you aren't going to have your classic crater left over that's, you know, this obvious bowl-shaped crater because the ice is going to cushion the impact. But let's try to visualize what would happen if you have a small space mountain, let's say a mile, two miles, three miles in diameter, moving at about 20 to 30,000 miles an hour, entering the atmosphere, heating to red hot, and then slamming into an ice sheet. What would then happen? What would, what would be some of the effects that would result from that? Everything would crack. Well, yes, there would be mechanical fracturing of the ice, most certainly, yes. And it wouldn't melt the ice. It would and there would be melting. tremendous amount of melting, yeah. If we were looking for a zone where something might have impacted, what would we expect to see after the ice has gone away? A, a lot of channels to the south. Okay, let's picture we've got this thick mass of ice over the mountains. Something comes in, strikes there introduces a tremendous amount of heat and mechanical energy, so you've got fracturing. What's going to be the general pattern of the fracturing, probably? It will go radiate. In radiate, 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 radiate. That's the word I want to hear. Radial. It'll be radial. It'll extend outwards from the, from the point of impact, won't it? Now, where the point of impact occurs, here you have this great discontinuity created in the ice. Let's assume that the impact is great enough that it fractures right to the base of the ice. What will happen to all of the meltwater? I think two things, possibly. Some of the meltwater will gush out over the top of the ice, but you've now got these fractures, so you're going to have a lot of meltwater pouring down to the base of the ice. Ice, you know, is only 90% the density of water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if the water reaches the base of the ice under enough pressure, Bill, what will happen to the ice? It, the ice. it will lift. Yes, 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 yes. We're getting the picture. We're getting the picture. <laughs> now, you've got to visualize in your mind after this process is over, what would you be looking for at that zone at A the lake. Epis Maybe, but certainly we could assume. There would also be some relics of the meteor hit. We need to address that because we yeah. don't have time tonight. But one of the largest meteorites in North America is mm -hmm. called the Willamette Meteorite. Yeah. It was found in the Willamette Valley amongst a group of rocks that were deposited by the Missoula Flood. Now we'll mm -hmm. come back to that. Yeah. But, but let's picture now water under tremendous turbulence and pressure reaching the base of the ice and then, as it comes down under pressure, which directions are it's going to flow? Radial. Radial. It's pretty much going to flow outwards, isn't it? When the thing is all gone, all done, the ice is gone, now you're looking for a zone that's going to be probably very chaotic and highly eroded mm -hmm. relative to the area around it. And you're going to be looking for some kind of a radial pattern of distribution, right? Okay, we've got a mental picture in our mind. Now, let's go up north here and see what we see right oh. there. Oh, where is that? <laughs> what do you see right here? Cool. What do you see right there? You see a chaotic terrain, and notice the channels away from it are all going in a radial pattern. Mm -hmm. And it's totally discontinuous from the normal folded sure mountain is. ranges here. This area right here, you see you have meltwater streams coming this way, you have major flows this way, you have this way, you have coming down here, and you have this way. Look at this area right here. That to me is the sus highly suspect terrain. And what's the closest and that's in British Columbia. Yeah, that's a, it's a big gap in the Rockies. Yes, look at that right there. That I suspect formed under very unusual circumstances. So, this is, cool. uh, hopefully mm -hmm. we can get that, if we have two weeks next summer, that's where we're, we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow the mountains up this way and then go into, into this area, too. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any other spots like this in Canada that are like starburst kind of things? Not that, not that not substantial. That so you'll notice here, too. You got about 10 minutes there, Sarge. Okay. This feature here is really wild. That's the Rocky Mountain Trench. Mm -hmm. Now, this whole thing was covered with ice. Now, what I'm speculating 
is this represents the epicenter of a high energy event. Water melted here and ran out in all directions and flowed down these troughs this way. Some of the water poured over the ice sheet. And when all that water reached down here, it just poured into this basin and created the channel scablands. Over here, as the water poured down, it backed up in all of these mountain valleys of western Montana and created a temporary backwater flood that the geologists have misinterpreted as being Lake Missoula. Yes, Dennis? According to the, what you showed us, where the heaviest ice was, it wasn't there. No, it wasn't there. <laughs> no. All right, so what caused all that to melt over there? What makes you think, Dennis, that that was the only impact? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't say that it was. Yeah, neither did I. But yeah, right there was a big kahuna right there. And here's what I'm suggesting happened. Of all the scenarios I've looked at, the one that seems to make the most sense, that fits the most evidence, would be something akin to what we saw Jupiter 1994. A multiple impact, one object fragmenting into multiple objects and impacting over a very short period of time. Is there any chance you could um, find iridium there? Iridium? The problem is if it's in the ice and that turns into meltwater and gushes into the ocean, it's going to be so dispersed. Mm -hmm. However, however, that's what I was talking about, what was so significant last year with Fire, Richard Firestone and his colleagues, is that they have been finding iridium at the Pleistocene Holocene boundary. Mm -hmm. Which to me was striking confirmation that when I first formulated these ideas 15 and 20 years ago that I was on the right track, but it was all theoretical and circumstantial rather than having actual hard geophysical or geochemical evidence, now Firestone and his colleagues have provided the hard evidence that shows that there was some kind of an encounter. Do they know the significance of that evidence? I think they're figuring it out. Jerry? Mm -hmm. Well, this, and the there other thing is so for that ice. spot up there in the Canadian Rockies, mm -hmm. um, the geologists may have already thought of something like that. Have, you, have they checked for anomalous uh, elevations? Like, is that spot lower? Or so lower? far, the literature that I have perused wouldn't suggest to me that anybody has made any connection with, a, with an impact up, well, up I'm in that talking region. about flow patterns for the water. Is, is, it, is it high or is it low? Or is the level of the mountains. Something it, unusual about that. Well, yes, it. yes and no. I mean, the Canadian studies, right now there's a rivalry between Canadian geologists and American geologists. It's really ridiculous but when you start talking to actually the Ice Age Floods Institute in Washington last year hosted a talk by Canadian geologists who came and said to them that the source of the Missoula flood water was Canada rather than Lake Missoula and that created a whole stir of controversy <laughs> and and because some of them in fact when when you'll you'll appreciate this bill a couple of years after our first trip, we stopped yeah. at the Dry Falls Visitor Center. Mm -hmm. There was a geologist who was the, the ranger there uh, at the Visitor Center. I went in and I started talking to him, and I mentioned John Shaw and some of the other Canadian geologists who were doing work suggesting that the water source was Canada and not Lake Missoula. Mm -hmm. And his response to me was, well, those Canadians, they just want to take credit for everything themselves. <laughs> Uh, well, um, whether or not that's true, I can't say, but that has no bearing on the argument. You know, either they've presented you, evidence you, that's legitimate or they haven't. Makes you wonder if Professor Breckenridge is in the office incognito, uh, the audience incognito listening to it, doesn't <clears throat> Yes. Now, the Pr Breckenridge that, that, uh, that he mentioned was a, uh, a glaciologist, a geologist that me and Bill, when we were out there, we went and visited him and interviewed him. <laughs> Because he was the guy who, of all the geologists, had done more work on the region of the supposed ice dam. Mm -hmm. And after about 30 minutes of conversation, he more or less tentatively offered that the ice dam was really a suspect idea. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Like, he like he here he was considered to be the foremost yeah. expert on the area of the ice dam, and he goes, 
Yeah, the whole ice dam idea, I just don't know about yeah. that. Okay, now here you can see I've put a graphic in to show the direction of water flows through the, the valleys of southern Canada, southern British Columbia, and how they all open up onto exactly where the channel scab lands are. Now see, Lake Missoula <clears throat> was over in these valleys, and any water, meltwater flowing down the Rocky Mountain Trench would have flowed into these valleys of Lake Missoula and got stuck there until it could flow back out this way. But you see the flow directions, the flow paths, all lead out right onto this channel of scab land, which is, which is exactly what Bretz was originally envisioning back in the 1920s, when everybody was calling him a wacko. Well, here, well, here's my graphic I've put oh, in here yeah. to show. Yeah, also, would have been under the ice. So, how big do you think it was? So we don't know really how that would look. Oh, probably a couple of miles in diameter, Ooh, at least, for the size of the, the chaotic field. So, but you can see there, there, what I've done is I've in introduced graphics to show all of the patterns away from that chaotic area. So, okay, so this I think is part of the explanation here, at least part of it. And I'm not saying that this is proven by any case. I'm saying that circumstantially it's very suggestive. And only further research will disclose whether this theory holds up. However, something melted the ice. And nobody else has come up with an explanation yet. And just like we went through the thought exercise trying to visualize what would, what would uh, be the after effect of an event like this, what we, were, what we were envisioning, I think we see it right in front of us there. There's even a central uplift. Mm -hmm. How cool. Right here. <clears throat> now, we haven't even begun to look at what's going on out here. <laughs> yeah, there might be more starburst. However, yeah, when we go up there, let's see, we might even be able to get a little indication from here. Oh, my when goodness. When we start looking at some of these gigantic water flows now, I am preparing a map of the whole of Canada where I'm, what I'm, purporting to do is to identify all of the discrete zones of impact oh. because what I'm hypothesizing here is a multiple impact event of which this you're seeing here is ostensibly one of a whole series. Cool. That's yeah. very good. Well, it makes that, sense. That's very Thank good. you. Ooh, good stuff. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right.